Welcome to the CC Report for the 15th of December 2017. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is Robert Barwick, CC's Research Director. Welcome, Robert. Thanks, Elisa. And on this week's show, insiders expose Australian banking as a corrupt cesspool protected by government. And Turnbull isn't protecting Australia's sovereignty. We don't have any. So firstly, this today is the last regular episode for the year. For the next three weeks, we will be screening special features. Uh, so look out for those and then we'll be resuming with the regular programming first thing in the new year. Uh, so for the first topic, insiders expose Australian banking as a corrupt cesspool protected by government. Now, we're updating, of course, on our major campaign of 2017, which has been extremely effective, which is the campaign against the government giving new powers to the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, APRA, uh, and this is known as the Crisis Resolution Powers Bill, and we'll put up the information to go to our website. If you haven't heard about this, if you're new to the show, uh, we, of course, have been campaigning relentlessly to stop this. It's been thrown into a Senate committee uh, to be examined, and they'll report back by early February. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, and it's it's not yet Monday the 18th of December or maybe it is Monday, you still have until the end of business today to make your submission, so make sure that you do. But these powers are dictatorial powers where Africa can just take over the banking system to keep it propped up in a crisis in a way though that sacrifices all its customers, right? And it's a, these, will be, these powers will be disastrous if, they've, if they're used like they have been in countries like in, in Europe where they've been used. So you have a chance to have your say, make your voice heard. Now on today's show, there's one main point that we want to make. And that is that everything you think you know about the Australian banking system is a lie. You know, things like uh, Australia survived the global financial crisis better than any other country. Australia's banks are better regulated than any other country in the world. They were, they were the claims that we've had, Australia's banks were sound during the global financial crisis. We've had them regurgitated for eight years, Lisa. If I've heard them once from politicians, I'm not exaggerating, I've heard them a thousand times, right? Um, that this, we are this, this great uh, financial system because APRA has these strong prudential standards that navigated us through the global financial crisis and it is rubbish. All of it is absolute rubbish. Now, it's not only us that is exposing this myth, but our campaign against these APRA bills has really brought it to the surface in a really exciting way because there are a number of insiders from within the banking system that are actually coming out, and there's no doubt more than even what we're aware of, and there will be more come out over the course of the next few months ahead as this bill uh, comes to the floor of the parliament for a vote. Um, so we're going to cite a number of experts. The first is John Dahlson. Now he was director of the ANZ Bank for 20 years. So this guy knows banking from the inside. He's also the former chairman of Woolworths. And in August 2016, he wrote a paper entitled Banks, I See Things Differently, which is a brilliant paper. Uh, and in it, he described the inner world of the Australian banks as, quote, private secretive, murky and dark. He's, you really get the sense when you read his paper that he's broken ranks. Um, he actually hasn't. He's just someone, he's a, he, was on the, he was a director on the ANZ Bank because he was a businessman. So he knows business. Um, he knows what business needs. His big concern is his bank, the, the purpose of banks is to fund the economic needs of Australia in terms of individuals and businesses and they're not doing that they're just speculating they're just extracting maximum profit with the minimum risk to them but maximum risk to their customers right and they're damaging the economy that's his big issue mm. so he's not one of the one broken ranks he's just reflecting the fact the banking system has veered off from what it's supposed to be doing mm. and he really lays a lot of the blame at the feet of APRA for that which is quite right to do so uh, he describes APRA as the monster that protects the banks from disaster and its constant interventions reduce competition. He went on to say that the banks defend their business walls from all intruders and nothing gets through because of APRA. And I just want to cite a few more quotes to give you the flavour of this because it's great. 
Uh, he describes what it's like inside this protected wall. He says, banks trade in parallel and are all the same. You could change the labels and no one would notice. He says, banks collude and are all the same. So the risk of concentration for Australia is acute. He says, conflict is rife. Insider trading is subtle and obtuse and seldom reported. And APRA, he says, is not concerned with customers and competition because they are not in their remit. Banks, he said, treat regulation as a game to protect their pay. They are more concerned about their rewards and their self-interest than the interests of customers and other stakeholders. Now this is, he's describing this dark, murky, secretive world which reminds you of what's called dark pools, which are these interbank trading houses where they exclude the public, they're set up in bank houses, the largest banks in the world, where they can do special deals and basically rig the system. I mean, so much for the free yeah, market. There, there is, that's right. And that's, that's partly where John Dalson's coming from. He, he's someone who believes in the free market and his point is what we've got is this rigged system overseen by this regulator, APRA. And I can assure you, Elisa, politicians, the average politician would not have a clue that the views of someone like John Dalson, who they'd respect, but they wouldn't have a clue of his views. They've been so brainwashed into thinking, oh, we've got this great regulator, oh, they want more powers, let's just give it to them. Well, they've been a disaster with the powers they've got. By definition, if, we have a, if we've had to have a royal commission into the banks because of their behaviour so bad, yet APRA supervised them all through that behaviour, right, then the royal commission should also be into APRA, but as part of the protection racket, Malcolm Turnbull excluded APRA from that. And one of the things that he raises, and the next gentleman we'll cite now raises, is one of the, uh, APRA's weapons is extreme secrecy. And that's how it's able to get away with this. Mm. Now we'll just take a quick break before we get on to the other expert that we're going to, say, to cite, and we'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're discussing the corrupt cesspool of the Australian banking system. Now, of course, we just cited a 20-year director of one of the big four Australian banks, ANZ, John Dalson, and his insights into the corruption that exists within the closed and secretive Australian banking system, which is completely protected from go to woe by the government. And of course, now the new legislation that they're presenting to give APRA extraordinary powers um, to take over bank boards and not be accountable for what they do when they step in to run the banks and that could include confiscating depositors money by the way so you need to read up on this and find out more watch some of our previous shows about this um, this legislation is giving APRA even more power to run this protection racket over the Australian banks that they're running so the other expert that we wanted to cite today who's also exposing the nature of this corrupt system is Dr. Wilson Sy. Now he's the former head of research and principal researcher at APRA. And what I'll cite is from a submission that he made to the Financial System Inquiry in 2014. So he accused APRA of secret dealings with the institutions it regulates and also how it was asleep at the wheel in regard to the risks that led to the 2008 global financial crash. So that right there is the, is the absolute opposite of every claim every member of parliament ha makes about APRA. Oh, this great reg regulator had strong prudential standards that saw us through the financial crisis. He was there at the time. He said, no, they were asleep to the risks. Yeah, he said that APRA failed to reject credit risk models or to challenge them on their technical accuracy during the GFC. So they knew exactly what could have occurred, as other banks internationally did. Um, you know, they knew a lot of the ratings given yeah. by Moody's and Standard & Poor's were completely fraudulent. They had to be, and yet they turned a blind eye to it all because they were raking it in. Because what APRA, what APRA is, is, is partly the, the fig leaf for self-regulation of banking, right? Um, that's, that's the real system we've got. But you've got to have an agency there that allows them to get away with this self-regulation. And the biggest part was on their risk. The biggest asp um, example of self-regulation was their risk models. His, Dr. Sy's argument, Elisa, is that the banks, um, what did save the Australian banks was 
the financial crisis started in America. And because there was this massive bailout of the American banks and panic around the world, before our banks actually fully hit the skids, some of that bailout money came back here and our government was able to launch their own form of mm. bailout in the form of the guarantees to preemptively save the banks here. Without those measures, our banks would have been as smashed as all the other banks in the world. That's yeah. his. That's his whole argument. There was no spectacular survival of you know of Australia's banks in the financial crisis. It was purely a fluke what we experienced. However, what we put off then is we, is a crisis that we're now starting to feel at, at the Today. moment. Today, right? yeah. we kick the can down the road, and the problem is worse. The debt is twice as big as it was in two thousand eight. When this crisis. When our banks come crashing down under the weight of their derivatives, which were 14 trillion in 2008, they're now 36 trillion. When they come crashing down under the weight of the property bubble, which is two and a half times the size it was in 2008, it's going to wipe them out mm. in a way that no government's going to be able to rescue. Yeah, the heavier you, the heavier you are, the harder you fall, and we've basically built up a much bigger problem. Um, so it's going to come back to bite us now. Let's talk about the solution because one of the things that John Darlson said is that the banks defend their business walls from all intruders and nothing gets through because of APRA. So you've got this, you know, walled little community of these banks that are super protected yeah. in there. And of course, what we want to propose is a different kind of wall. That's right. So instead of the banks having this wall that protects them from the, their customers' interests, right? What we have to go back is to understand banks have a duty of care because they get to hold customers' money. That's actually a, a responsibility. That it's, a, it's a privilege they have to hold customers' money. What needs to be walled off is that customers' money, the deposits, from the kind of gambling that banks like to do. That's called Glass-Steagall, right? There's a t it's a two-part financial system. Um, one of the logics in Glass-Steagall is it's so straightforward, a line down the middle, Instead of having um, you know, millions of pages of regulation trying to tweak everything, just have a line down the middle. And on this side, the, the, the rules are rock solid. You can't gamble with deposits. All deposits on this side, you can't gamble with them. On the other side, instead of regulators racing around trying to keep track of what the banks are up to, let them go nuts. But everybody knows if you're on that side, you are there at your own risk. Mm. No one's savings are there. People want to gamble, well go and gamble. But the losses you make you will eat yourself. No one will bail you out. And what that does, of course, is it stops people going over that side, mm -hmm. right? Because all the gambling we've had for the last 40 years in the financial system has been protected by governments. Mm -hmm. They've had a welfare safety net. <laughs> and of course, what's particularly bitterly ironic about that is these bankers are the ones who are the biggest neoliberals who say ordinary poor people shouldn't have a welfare safety net. We'll take exactly. that away from them. Mm. Kill them all. We don't care. Yeah, right? we've got to have a free market except, we'll have a free when, it market, except when it comes to banks. when it comes to banks, exactly. And of course, um, I got to meet a former Macquarie Bank executive, and Macquarie Bank is the worst for this in Australia, funds all these think tanks that, that pre preach this neoliberal rubbish. And he was there the night Macquarie Bank in 2008 was begging the government for guarantees to keep it afloat. And he said to me, I never thought I'd see Macquarie Bank in favour of government intervention. <laughs> but of course, when it came to them, I did. So that's the, that's the principle. There's a, you know, it's about economic justice, right? First and foremost, and then secondarily, but it's connected, it's about the economy actually working because when you have a Glass-Steagall system, the, the, you keep um, financial resources in the real economy and if they can't be diverted off for gambling, guess what? They end yeah. up doing useful things, right? Mm -hmm. More people invest in businesses that are more productive. More people will buy um, things like government bonds so the governments can have more money to go and build infrastructure, etc. That's what happens in a proper financial system. And that's what Glass-Steagall can provide. Mm. And just another note that this APRA legislation is part of a big international plan uh, run out of the Bank of England and the Bank for International Settlements to get bail-in laws where deposits can be confiscated to save the banks in a new financial crisis across the world. And so I just wanted to mention that uh, a bail-in law, this same similar type of legislation that we've got here in Australia, has come up in India and there's quite a furor over that there and it's also been thrown into a committee, a parliamentary yep. committee there also. Um, and it's part of a push for this across Asia because as Moody's noted, uh, the ratings agency at the end of November, 
they said that most Asia-Pacific jurisdictions still lack statutory powers to bail in creditors. They only have in place uh, contractual securities such as hybrid or bail-in bonds uh, that can be bailed in and turned into worthless shares during a crisis, but there, there needs to be more momentum to get actual bail-in powers through governments. It just um, shows you the top-down, internationally directed nature of what we're fighting here, right? Mm. This is not an Australian government policy, this no. is an international policy. Yeah, and you can read more about it by calling in, if you haven't already, to get a free copy of our Australian Alert Service, which is our weekly publication that backs up everything we say here. So we'll stop there for the moment and we'll come back and discuss uh, Australia's foreign policy and how, just like with this APRA bill, we are not actually sovereign. Welcome back to the CEC report. Turnbull isn't protecting Australia's sovereignty. We don't have any. So right after the Sam Dastyari scandal that broke a couple of weeks ago, which we talked about on last week's show. And he's now had to resign from the Senate. That's right. So that's new since then. But right after, the government had ready to go, fully prepared um, amendments to legislation to change our foreign interference laws uh, to make it easier to act against people that uh, do what uh, Dastyari and others have allegedly done. Um, now, Turnbull, of course, is saying, firstly, that this is not aimed at China, which is obviously not true and, you know... Uh, We're not going to single out China, he said, <laughs> after having singled out nothing but China. Exactly. Um, but he also said that he was acting to protect our sovereignty and our national interests. But, of course, you know, when you're singling out our largest trading partner in such a way, and there's other provocations that we've talked about, such as um, making exercises in the South China Sea and so forth, how can you... Uh, be defending our national interests. Australian national interests are in this region and we have to be friendly with our neighbours and work with them. That's right. And we're not just singling out, it's not just the question of China as our largest trading partner, it's that the, the particular things we're doing are uh, risk war. Mm. That's the point. And we'll, we'll, we're going to show some videos on that in a second. Just to give some context though, Elisa, um, another Prime Minister named Malcolm, Malcolm Fraser, before he died, he wrote a book called Dangerous Allies and he made this claim and I spoke to him about it. Australia has never had any sovereignty. His, his point is we've always had a foreign policy that's been defined by the United Kingdom first and then the United States, right? We don't operate as a sovereign nation. That was, that was his issue. And the proof of that was the Iraq war, mm. right? Because if you look at the Iraq war, was that in our interest? No, it was actually a war crime in fact. But we're gonna play a video now where the Australian Prime Minister, John Howard, gave a speech justifying the war a few days before it started and look how his speech compares to the speech of the Canadian Prime Minister, Stephen Harper. The world judged the Iraqi regime was a dangerous aggressor. In the interests of world peace and regional security, the community of nations required Iraq to surrender its offensive arsenal, its chemical and biological weapons, and abandon its nuclear weapons program. Iraq agreed to comply. The world judged the Iraqi regime to be a dangerous aggressor. In the interests of world peace and regional security, the community of nations expelled Iraq from Kuwait, required Iraq to sur surrender its offensive arsenal, chemical, biological weapons, and to abandon its nuclear weapons program. Iraq agreed to comply. Iraq Iraq's continued, continued defiance, defiance of the community of nations, the community of nations. Challenges which must be addressed. Presents a challenge which must the be addressed. The member It is inherently, it is inherently dangerous, dangerous to, allow a country such as to allow a country such as Iraq to retain weapons, to retain weapons, of, weapons mass of mass destruction, destruction particularly, particularly in, in the light of its past aggressive, past aggressive behaviour. So what, and that video could go on. You can look it up on YouTube. What's obvious though, Elisa, is that, that that speech was not written in Australia. It wasn't written in Canada. It was given to them by someone outside the United States, in the United States or the United Kingdom or both. So this is what you're going to say. That's who runs our foreign policy. Yeah. And now the issue, of course, is China. And uh, it's interesting to note that when Sam Dastyari made his comments about uh, China's borders are its own issue. He was reacting to a day prior, Senator Stephen Conroy saying, well, we're going to do exercises in the South China Sea, some provocative action. So we're now going to hear what Malcolm Fraser had to say about the South China Sea. 
I've been told by Americans that China is a threat to freedom of the seas in the East and South China Sea. It's an absurd claim. Two thirds of their own trade goes through those seas. It's a two way business, a two way benefit to China and to America and the countries between. Nobody would want to upset that trade. It is extraordinary bad judgment to suggest that America needs the military build up to protect commercial and trade interests. The commercial and trade interests do not need military support to be progressed in today's world. ASEAN countries have demonstrated that if left to themselves, they can form a useful and effective association. They've overcome past enmities and now ASEAN contributes greatly to stability in the region. ASEAN is also negotiating with China, which may be difficult to achieve for a code of conduct in the South China Sea. America has had no part in this, and America's interference now would make agreement harder to achieve. The United States would not regard USS Washington patrolling the East and South China Seas, stationed in the Japanese harbor, as being provocative, even sailing within sight of the Chinese mainland. Imagine, however, the American reaction if the Chinese had such a carrier, which one day they will, and copied that action off the east coast of the United States within sight of the American mainland. It would then be regarded as a major and dangerous provocation. And then, Elisa, Malcolm Fraser made an even more profound point that the real source of danger in our region is not China. Listen to this. Sometimes great powers during a period of relative decline, and it is relative decline because power in other parts of the world are growing and at a greater rate than American power will grow. But a declining power in relative terms can be more dangerous than a rising power. The last part of my book discusses Australia's position in this strategic context. I've made it clear that the strategic dependence was appropriate during the Cold War and indeed in earlier times. I had believed after the fall of the Soviet Union that we could become more independent, have our own voice in international affairs. I've had more than one senior leader throughout Asia say to me, of course we will talk to Australia, we'll welcome Australian leaders, but we don't need Australia to give us American views. We talk directly to America ourselves. It is one of the advantages of age. You can perhaps build relationships over time which will never be experienced by governments in office. Instead of exercising a degree of strategic independence after 1991, we have over the last 25 years become more closely enmeshed in the American military machine than ever before. I assert that our constitutional independence will not protect us if America goes to war in the Pacific. If they go to war, we will have to go to war on current policy settings. And he concluded that by saying that allowing the US the effective power to take Australia to war is abdicating our sovereignty and that is a step much too far. And that's a damning indictment of, of policy today. Yep. So that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Thank you. And join, in, join us again next week and next year for and the CEC report. Mm -hmm.